good morning uh, uh, brethren ladies and gentlemen uh, welcome to another episode of the quarry side chat where we interview freemasons and discuss topics about the past the present as well as the future of freemasonry in the 21st century as a reminder the thoughts and opinions expressed here are the sole opinion of the participants and do not represent any grand lodge statements or positions make sure you keep your conversation open to the public and on the level we are happy to welcome our guest speaker for the day worshipful brother dasarathi manivannan worshipful brother dasarathi manivannan was initiated into lodge shrinivas gopala number 190 the first lodge uh, named after the right worshipful the regional grand master of the regional grand lodge of southern india and he was passed raised and ascended the eastern chair in the same lodge he is an avid quizzer an avid cricketer he captained the lodge team which won the tournament that particular year his quiz moves around the world on masonry he comes out with polyminoes he comes out with crossword puzzles and he makes a lot of these presentations is a very interesting person and one of the few masons in south india who has the distinction of being awarded the diploma in masonic education by the grand lodge of india over to worshipful brother dasarathi manivanna a very good morning to the panelists of quarry side chat brother sanjay ranganathan brother richard mehta in absentia worshipful brother pj ramanujan worshipful brother sri vardhan sinha brother sumit kumar and worshipful brother rudreshwar malkani and the special invitees worshipful master of lord shrinivas gopala number 190 worshipful brother pk bupati and my dear brother s padmanabhan i thank the panelists especially brother richard and brother sanjay for giving me an opportunity to present a lecture today under the quarry side chat platform my knowledge on masonry is limited nevertheless my curiosity to look into the meanings of the teachings is extremely high and i am very passionate about doing research on masonic topics and to share them with others let's keep our session interactive with me starting the sharing first the topic of our session today is yom kippur day of atonement though this refers to one festival and one particular day in a year let us make use of the opportunity to dwell into more matters of interest and purpose since the time humans evolved in this planet there was and still is one unanswered question who is the creator of the universe if at all there is one who is it we call god can we see and feel him how does he manifest himself in our lives this presentation brother then hovers around this central theme let's get started i have given a mystery title since masonry is all about mysteries and privileges when hiram abif was found missing and later found dead there were many unanswered questions by whom why where where and how in the story of king solomon building the first temple around 900 his chief architect hiram abif was slain withheld the secret till his last breath thus keeping up the promise at the cost of giving up his life this is one of the important tenets of freemasonry to never give away the secrets entrusted to us the st- story goes that after hiram abib's mortal remains were brought back to his jerusalem king solomon ordered him to be buried with the fullest respects and honor 
how he was interred is explained as follows quote he was not buried in the sanctum sanctorum because nothing common or unclean was allowed to enter there not even the high priest now brethren in this passage there are many things that are not explained up front our mission today is to unravel the meanings of these keywords common or unclean all flesh was deemed unclean what do they mean high priest who was he what was his name once a year when was it what was the date after many washings and purification against the great day of expiation for sins what does it mean when was it israelish israelitish law what exactly was this law let's first take the israelitish law and read the history in ancient times before any statute the general law or rules followed by people where the readings of the holy books what we call the volumes of sacred law where we see the word law appearing in fact religions were formed in different parts of the world with the sole intention to bring in a system of orderliness of the mind and action among the people as in those times there was brutal force used by man to gain his ends and he had a free hand to do what he urged for religions were man made to bring values and standards in people all religions had two common fundamental tenets to respect nature and the fellow human being and to see god within ourselves now let's see the history of the israelitish law between 600 and 1000 ad there lived a group of jewish scribes scholars called masoretes who compiled the ancient scriptures originally written in semitic languages which were 3000 years bc onwards with diacritical notes pronunciations and vocabulary totally together called the masora to standardize the hebrew bible tanakh which was written around 1200 bc in aramaic text so that jews all over the world could e- read it easily this was called the masoretic text the hebrew bible or tanakh which was written around 1200 bc consists of 24 books five written called the torah or pentateuch meaning five books of moses and 19 narrative books the first book of torah the word torah itself meaning teaching or law is the book of genesis which explains the creation of the world it also tells about the famine in israel which forced the israelites to leave israel to go to the land of goshen in egypt the second book of the torah was called the exodus this tells about the relief of the israelites from slavery of the pharaoh in egypt and their departure from egypt back to israel under the leadership of moses who was also called israel the name israel comes as another name for moses as for the will of god yahweh the book of exodus also tells about the building of the tabernacle the structure and how it has to be and the 10 commandments are also explained here the important part of the torah the third book which is to israel leviticus the word refers to the priestly tribes of 
tribe of Israelites called the Levi, after Levi, the third son of Jacob and Leah. As we know, brethren, the 12 tribes of Israel are named after the 12 sons of Jacob. Leviticus emphasizes on the ritual, moral, and legal practices to be followed inside the tabernacle and the offerings made there by the priests. Whereas the book of Exodus talks about the method of construction of the tabernacle, the book of Leviticus talks about the procedures to be followed inside the tabernacle. This book talks about God wishing to live in humans, but for that, people have to be devoid of sins and guilt. In order to purify humans from their sins and guilt, offerings were made to God by the priests so that God can continue to live in the tabernacle amidst the humans. Leviticus chapters. The first five chapters talk about the sacrifices, how they have to be made and details. Chapter six and eight called the Zav, talk about the ordination of the priests and also about the sacrifices. Shemini, chapters 9 to 11, talk about the consecration of the tabernacle. 12 and 13, about childbirth, skin diseases and clothing. Chapter 13 specifically, brethren, is of importance to us because it explains about the laws regarding skin diseases which were very widespread and rampant in those days mainly leprosy. If any person was found to be having some spots on the skin, he was taken to the priest and then quarantined for seven days, clean or unclean by the priest. If unclean, he was isolated for the further period of time until he became normal. Chapter 14 also talks different from leprosy. So here the discrimination from are explained and the things like that. Chapter 15 is about bodily stores and discharges and the procedures to be followed. Again, on the health condition, the priest would term the person clean or unclean. Chapter 16 was about Yom Kippur specifically. And the other chapters were about many other things which are explained here. Thus, on the whole, brethren, every person who entered the temple was checked by the authorities for any health problem to avoid any risk. All flesh was sub sub suspected to have some problem and they were looked at as unclean. The people were generally looked at as having the risk of having some health problem. That is unclean, unless otherwise proved. As a rule, only the high priest was allowed to enter the sanctum sanctum and that too once a year. This was entirely from a hygiene point of view. So brethren, we are now unraveling the mystery of two key words. First, what was meant by common or unclean and what is meant by all flesh was deemed unclean. We now learn that skin diseases, leprosy, plague were common. So people were generally looked at as having a risk of skin diseases. So in the Israelitish law, was the book of Leviticus, which was a part of the Torah, and the Torah itself part of the Tanakh. So now we unravel. I would like to inform you that in 56 by Bedouin shepherds and team of archaeologists is a portion of the Leviticus. So this is proof that Leviticus and the Leviticus before 
for about the Israelitish law is explained. Had the exclusive rights to perform the rituals and offerings in the holy of holies, and at the altar of God Yahweh. The rest of the Levites were given, like I said before, other jobs, like singing, guarding, carrying, etc. The patrilineal descendants of Aaron were Eleazar, whose picture is given below, Phineas, Abishua. This is from father to son, father to son. Buki, Uzi, Zerakiah, Mirayoth, Azariah, Amariah, Ahitub, and we come to the important person, Zadok. This is an image of Zadok. Zadok himself, itself meaning righteous, justified. He was the head priest at the time of King Solomon and also at the time of King uh, David. He was very close to King David. And as we know, King David was very involved in wars. He made a lot of bloodshed. And that's why God did not allow him to build the temple. He instead asked him to make Solomon build the temple. Zadok, in fact, once volunteered to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. David According to Kings one thirty nine, the high priest at the time of King Solomon's temple and Ahira Aharia. And their descendants were the high priests later on, up to the time of destruction of the first temple and the construction of the second. Now we are now unraveling the mystery of the next set of keywords. We learned that the high priest was Kohen Zedok. Moving on, we come now to some time frames. In the science of making calendars, there are two types. One is called a solar calendar and the other one a luni solar calendar. The Gregorian calendar, which was started by Pope Gregory, and the earlier one, the Julian calendar, which was uh, in the time of Julius Caesar, is the present style of calendar that we use now all over the world, which looks like this. However, a very ancient type of Hebrew uh, calendar, similar to that followed by the Hindus, Jains, Buddhists, Kurdish, Burmese, Chinese, Japanese, Tibetan, Vietnamese, Mongolian, Korean, Hellenic. They all followed a uh, science of calendar, system of calendar called the Luni Solar Calendar. The Luni Solar Calendar took into account the phases of the moon as well as the movement of the sun. The birth of the full moon marked the start of a new month. So lunar plus solar is called the lunisolar calendar. The Hebrew calendar being a lunisolar calendar is, have, is like this. The inside circle shows the Gregorian calendar and the, 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 the names of the months corresponding to the different months of the Hebrew calendar. When we, in the bottom, we see the word Tishrai. <clears throat> this is the seventh month. The first day of this month is called the New Year or Rosh Hashanah in Hebrew, which means head of the year. The tenth day of Tishrai is called Yom Kippur. Yom meaning day and Kippur meaning atone. It is considered the holiest day of the year, this entire year, and the Sabbaths of Sabbaths. In the year, there are many Sabbaths, but this being the most important, it is the most important Sabbath. In the lunisolar calendar, the day starts from the evening at sunset and ends at sunset the next day. So evening to evening. So Yom Kippur is also celebrated from the dusk of 
10th day and ends at the dusk of the 11th day. The month before Tishrai called Elul has 30 days. And for Yom Kippur, from the this entire 40 days is called called the holy days my teshua or the 10 days of repentance and it culminates on yom kippur so the 40 days fasting and the 10 days of intense days of repentance culminates on Yom Kippur, which is the peak of the 40 days fasting. Brethren, on Rosh Hashanah, that is the new year, the first day of Teshrai, the shofar is blown in synagogues. It is also blown on every weekday during the 40 days and at the end of Yom Kippur. According to the Talmud, Talmud is the oral Torah. A shofar is made from a horn of an animal of a ram. It can be a horn of any animal in the Bovide family. But they say preferably a ram. The Bovide family, in which each animal is called a bovid, the animals are bison, African buffalo, water buffalo, antelopes, sheep, goats, musk, oxen, and domestic cattle, but not cow. During the, uh, uh, these days of wearing leather footwear, bathing and washing, anointing with perfumes and lotions, one seeks for forgiveness from whom they have wronged. The 10 days are an opportunity to mend one's way to alter the judgment in his favor. Unlike the usual three times on Yom Kippur, there are five prayer services. As per the Torah, Yom Kippur is the day when a person has to give account of his actions in the preceding 364 days of the year and plead forgiveness for his sins and guilt. It is the day of cleansing oneself from the negatives and purify the mind, paving the way for God to be seen. Atone, brethren, is at plus one, that is to be one with God. Yom Kippur is the day of atonement or the day of expiation for one's sins. We see here a picture where a man is removing some parts of the rock and he is able to get his own image in it. What actually happens is this. The human mind is like a block of rock. When the sculptor removes the excrescences or the unwanted things, he brings out the statue of God to be visible. Similarly, when we purify our mind by removing the unwanted thoughts, we can see God within us. Yom Kippur is a festival when one realizes his wrongs and vows to never repeat. It's a way of redemption and salvation. Now, we unravel the mystery of this key word, once a year, which we now understand and know that it is the 10th day of the 7th month of Tishrai. And the great day of expiation for sins is the day of Yom, Yom Kippur. We will come to the last part of the key words mystery, which is the, un the different type. In J Judaism, brethren, ritual washing or ablution is done in two ways. One is by the villa or the full body immersion in a living water source called mikveh. A mikveh is a pool of water, which is not a stagnant water, but a living water from a natural source. The second type of ritual washing is washing the hand in a cup. On Yom Kippur, the Kohen Gadol was made to 
enter the holy of holies only after bathing five times in the mikveh to attain ritual purity a mikveh is a collection of water usually about 3 cubits deep one cubit is about 1 and 1/2 feet and which supposed to have 40 ca of water about 100 575 liters now we now understand that the meaning of many washings is five times in mikveh and hand washing in the cup so putting together all the mystery uh, the, the the key words and unraveling the mystery we see that the purpose of this session has been solved has been reached and we have found answers to all these mysteries let's come to the part of the 40 days fasting why 40 days there are many significances to this moses fasted for 40 days before receiving the 10 commandments on mount sinai jesus spent 40 days fasting in the wilderness zoroastrians undergo a 40 day fasting ritual known as the hanuman chalisa Jains perform a 40 day water only fasting called upvas. We in Hindus in South India we have a viradham for 40 days to go to Sabarimala temple to see Lord Ayappa. And before Christmas Christians have the nativity fast for 40 days. There is a 40 day sadhana yoga practice. There are normally many health fitness programs called 40 day detox and 40 day resets. and most importantly the kundalini awakening is done after a 40 day program the kundalini science was known to us ancient indians thousands and thousands of years before during the time of the vedas and it is clearly written in the upanishads what i feel brethren is that the body undergoes a severe test of stress and at this time it secretes some hormones as a self defense mechanism and to fight against the virus and to safeguard the body from illnesses just like some plants which thrive in very arid conditions they secrete the essential oils as a self defense mechanism and thus the body becomes strong finally the top we mentioned that yom kippur was a day of atonement let us compare this word atonement to self realization when yom kippur is 40 days strenuous fasting and self uh, control of the mind to expiate oneself from guilt and sin to let god live in them in india the understanding is relating to self realization or the understanding of the atman this is a formula from the bhagavad gita man minus vasanas equals god the vasanas are the unmanifest desires in our mind the unwanted negative emotions and thoughts so if we can relieve ourselves of all these negative vasanas what we see remaining is equal to god this is symbolized by our breaking the coconuts when we break coconuts it is not a superstition there is a meaning of this the outer shell of the coconuts consists of the hard husk which are all equal to the vasanas the unmanifest desires the unwanted guilt and sins and everything first we have to get rid of them and there we see the hard shell which is the skeleton which relates to the bodily pleasures and what we seek for the body to put clothes on to have jewels to have sexual pleasures beyond the requirements this is the points relating to the shell when we break that also what we see inside is the pure soul so when a person when a devotee breaks a coconut he tells himself i will get rid of my vasanas i will get rid of my negative emotions and i will get rid of my bodily uh, pleasures and then i want to see god so if he does it 108 times so many times he reassures his mind and strengthens his subconscious mind and then he is able to uh, see self realization so brethren this concludes this session on yom kippur and atonement finally ending up with self realization so we can say in a nutshell that if you are within god god is within you thank you brethren
Please press the oh, yeah. Yom Kippur is the most holy and solemn day of the Jewish calendar. It is the only day when the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies, the most sacred place within the tabernacle and ancient temples. It was the only day when the high priest reconciled Israel with God and symbolically brought them back into the presence of the Lord. No other day and no other ancient ritual comes closer to the full meaning and purpose of the atonement of Jesus Christ. The fall season of festivals begins with Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the Jewish New Year. Rosh Hashanah marks the start of a 10-day period of repentance and preparation for the Day of Atonement. During these 10 days, Israelites would seek to draw closer to God in preparation for these sacred rituals. On the Day of Atonement, all of Israel would be forgiven for their sins of the previous year, thus allowing them to be cleansed and prepared for the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot, to occur five days later. Feast of Tabernacles was the final and most joyous of the three major Jewish feasts of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. The Day of Atonement followed a complex yet beautiful ritual, symbolizing that all of Israel now had been forgiven and was able to re-enter the presence of the Lord through the High Priest. The ritual began with the high priest, dressed in his normal colorful golden garments, offering the daily morning ritual of sacrifices and burning of incense on the altar of incense. He then would wash his flesh and change into simple white robes. The act of washing and changing clothes would actually occur five separate times throughout the ritual. The wearing of just the white robes could symbolize the Savior, who leaving his heavenly throne laid aside all the glory, and put upon himself the plain robe of humanity, becoming like one of us. The color of white is also a powerful symbol of purity, representing the absolute purity of the true great high priest, even Jesus Christ. Next, the high priest would bring two goats into the tabernacle or temple, and cast lots for each of them. One lot was for Azael or the scapegoat, and the other was for the Lord. A red ribbon was tied around the horns of the scapegoat to distinguish it from the other goat. The high priest would then take a bullock, or young bull, and place his hands on its head, symbolically transferring his own sins and the sins of his fellow priests to the bull. He would then slit the throat of the bull and catch the blood in a dish to be saved for later services. He then would bring a burning coal from the altar of sacrifice and incense into the Holy of Holies through the veil for the first time. Here dressed in all white, the high priest would burn the incense before the Lord. The room would fill with smoke, the cloud of smoke often being a symbol of the presence of God. The high priest then would exit the Holy of Holies, wash again, and take the blood of the bull and re-enter the Holy of Holies for a second time. He would then sprinkle seven times the blood of the bull on the Ark of the Covenant. The shedding of the blood of the young bull represented that the high priest was forgiven and reconciled to enter into the presence of the Lord. The high priest would then kill the goat that was chosen for the Lord, again saving the blood in a dish. He then would enter the Holy of Holies with this blood for the third and final time. As he did before, he would sprinkle the blood of the goat seven times before the ark. As the goat was the offering for the people, this act of bringing its blood into the Holy of Holies represented that all of Israel was symbolically able to enter the presence of the Lord through the high priest and because of the shedding of the blood of the sacrifice. Just as the high priest could only enter by blood, so too it is only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ that we can enter God's presence. As the high priest exited the Holy of Holies, he would then sprinkle the combined blood of the bull and the goat before the veil of the tabernacle. He would also use the blood to cover the four horns of the altar of incense. 
The remaining blood would be poured out at the base of the altar of sacrifice in the outer court. The high priest would then return to the scapegoat and place his hands upon its head, symbolically transferring the sins of all of the people to the goat. He then would utter the sacred name of the Lord, which was never to be said except on this holy day. O Jehovah, I entreat thee, your people, the house of Israel, has been iniquitous, sinned, and erred before you. O then, Jehovah, cover over, I entreat thee, upon their iniquities, their transgressions, and their sins. The goat was then taken outside of the tabernacle and led into the wilderness. The guiltless goat, dependent upon its owner for its care and protection, would become lost and die in the desert. Perhaps no symbol of the Savior is more powerful than the scapegoat. Innocent of any wrongdoing, just like this goat, the Savior has had laid upon him the sins of the world. As Isaiah so beautifully stated, like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Modern readers often gloss over the significance of the Day of Atonement as simply an outdated, archaic ritual of death and covering <laughs> of blood. However, as one better understands each of the aspects, it teaches a powerful message of the Atonement of Jesus Christ. The word atonement, or kafar in Hebrew, actually means to cover. Thus, as the high priest literally covers with blood the ark, the veil, and the altars of the tabernacle, he symbolically shows that atonement has been made, and that the way is now open to progress back to the tabernacle because of the shedding of blood. From the scriptures, we learn that when the Savior went to pray and suffer in Gethsemane, he first left eight disciples at the entrance, then took Peter, James, and John further into the garden, and then by himself went further into pray. Though it is impossible to know the exact reason for this three-level progression the Savior creates within the garden, it has a strong correlation to the three levels of the tabernacle with the outer courtyard, the holy place, and the holy of holies. It is as if the Savior desired to recreate these three levels to show that was officiating as our great high priest. Excellent, uh, uh, Brother Mani. Very good uh, lecture. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to ask you a quick question. So could you explain to me a bit about the uh, golden calf and its association to it? As you were saying earlier, I that mean... the um, horn can be made from uh, any of the bovine, but they cannot be made from the ones that are of cow lineage, if I was not mistaken. Yes. Now you mentioned that, yes. right? True. Could you True. explain to me a bit on that, on the reason for that? Uh, well, I think uh, in my understanding, the cow has been uh, looked at as a sacred animal. And so it is not to be slaughtered. If you see the details of the list of animals which can be slaughtered, which is which is also explained in the uh, Leviticus, uh, in one of the chapters, the cow is not mentioned. So there are descriptions of what animals can be given for sacrifice. So in that, the cow doesn't uh, come in. So the cow is not to be touched at all. So to even to make the horn, only the other types of animals can be used. So that is the explanation for that in my understanding. They, they wear leather shoes, if I'm not mistaken, as well. Would yes. that be out of cow material, or are you saying that leather no, would it, be from other material? It cannot be cows. Nothing yes. they use. Nothing from cows should be touched. Okay. okay. I think uh, Brother Padmanavan had something to ask. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to congratulate uh, Brother Manivandan for the wonderful presentation. I think he has done a lot of research and uh, he shared a lot of information. Of course, uh, uh, too many information in a short time. So we are able to take the extract of it. I just wanted to thank him for the taking time off to do this presentation. Uh, congratulations, uh, Brother Manivand. Thank you, Brother Pandu. Appreciate your... Uh... Congratulations, Brother Manivand. This Yom Kippur, no? Significance of Yom Kippur. 
now we are able to you know analyze fully through the knowledge shared by our worship brother manivan hats off to him yeah. thank you master yeah how would you say this sort of interconnects with the freemasonry in this context of the world yeah well uh, see freemasonry talks about uh, many things connecting to our our own self for example uh, masonry universal the um, three knocks of the three degrees also relate to the body mind and the soul so the 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 three knocks also as you know the gap between them in the first degree how it is in the second and third degree how it is mainly the universal the masonry universal part i feel which talks about the microcosm and the macrocosm which is between connection between the god and the man so which says that the microcosm uh, is same as the macrocosm that means we are same as god we are equal to god but for that we have to do certain uh, things so i feel masonry has a lot of connections with this uh, atonement and self realization i agree with you as saint paul said uh, you are the inner christ the spirit of god dwells inside you which also attributes to our sanatana dharma where you have the atma the paramatma the jivatma and the paramatma and the paramatma residing inside the jivatma and the jivatma residing inside the body which is what the greeks and the egyptians also called that the soul is imprisoned inside the body and it is waiting for the day when it can become free again and soar into the sky only to fall back and once again germinate in the seed and the constant going of uh, flux of the uh, births and rebirths uh, i think that's what most of the civilizations and cultures also speak about excellent worshipful uh, uh, brother dasarathi manivandan with this uh, we come to the end of the uh, program uh, uh, brethren uh, please feel free to give your feedback in the comments below and a hearty thanks to all the brethren and the visitors who have joined us on today's episode we hope you that you found something special and informative we look forward to interacting with you our social media handles where you can express your opinions views or post queries about freemasonry links are in the description below so join us uh, once again next time for an all new episode until that time please subscribe hit the subscribe button hit the press the bell icon or give us a thumbs up sign and join us the same masonic time the same masonic place the quarry side chat wishes you a magical week ahead until we meet again let's part on the square thank you goodbye thank you brother and all thank you thank, thank you, you.